Hello everybody. We're going to start the study of Ephesians. Let me see if I can. I'm at the ranch in Sandia and I just passed up a couple of, you got a bunch of flowers and I wanted to catch that little butterfly. There's a few, uh, I saw a nice spider as I was walking. You can teach on various things, but butterfly, new life, it's always representative. So that's a nice uh, little, hopefully I caught it for you. At the end of the book of Acts, we had, I, I wasn't going to start a whole new study, but I needed something to do on the next series, so I said, oh, I'll start Ephesians. And being we just finished the book of Acts, it would it's appropriate to begin with one of the letters to the churches that we read about in the book of Acts, that Paul went to these cities and preached the gospel. So I figured it would be good to uh, teach one of the letters. I already did Galatians, already taught Romans, uh, and a few others. Oh, Corinthians, I have a text study written. I've not done video links, so I thought, oh, I could do Corinthians, but first, say Corinthians is kind of long, so Ephesians is uh, six chapters. A little background, this will be the introduction, and then I'll cover the chapter. Uh, in Ephesus, the city that this letter was written to, the Ephesians, we read the history of it when we studied Acts 19. And if you go, I'll try to link Acts 19 to this teaching video, historical content, and then what Paul was writing. But in Acts 19, uh, in the city of Ephesus, it was known, if you remember the study, for the, quote, great temple of the Roman goddess Diana. And in the Greek, it's Artemis, that goddess. So you uh, have different translations, you know, certain Bibles will actually say Artemis. You know. But it was, a, this is what we say is a pagan, idolatrous city. But Ephesus was, there was, some major cities at the time of Christ, major cities that Paul was going to in Asia Minor, and Ephesus was really a major, it was the capital of the Roman province of uh, Asia. I believe it in, was in Western Asia, but it was that capital city. So that's why Paul spent a couple of years there, and it was like a center. And so if you have the influence in the center cities, then good, the word, the message would get out. And in Ephesus, uh, Paul had a lot of, if you go back to that chapter, they had a lot of persecution in that city. And in the ancient world, at the time of Paul the Apostle in the first century, it also had a, uh, a, a river that led to the Aegean Sea. Um, if w Later on, that river silted up, but it was a harbor, port harbor city for that reason. I uh, forget the name of the river, uh, something with the sea, but that's why it was so influential. And it was considered, the temple itself, that pagan temple to the goddess Diana, was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so there was a lot of development, a lot of influence in this city, and later on the Apostle John will write and give a rebuke in the letter uh, which we call the Revelation. And he rebukes it because there are very seven churches that the book of Revelation was written to by the Apostle John while he was on the Isle of Patmos. But in this letter, as we begin it now, it's sort of a little different than some of the other epistles. And we don't know for sure when Paul wrote this letter, but more than likely, as we finished our Acts study, I taught how Paul was in house prison, house arrest in Rome from A.D. 60 to A.D. 62. He was later released, later and captured again and executed by the Emperor Nero, Paul and Peter both, history tells us. Now, it's probably that this is one of the, what we refer to as kind of the prison epistles or prison letters, because he probably wrote it while he was under that house arrest. We don't know for sure, but more than likely that's when he wrote it. And it's general, almost in the sense that 
some of the other letters of the Apostle Paul, particularly Romans, uh, if you read chapter 16, I believe, you have a lot of personal greetings, a lot of personal names, talking to people at that particular city. Uh, you know this one, that one, sometimes a lot of rebukes. But Ephes, uh, the letter to the Ephesians doesn't have a lot of that personal stuff. So, later on, some Christians, and as we study the early documents, uh, some of the letters later on, as it was circulated, it didn't say, to the Ephesians. Uh, but that's, of course, not what we refer to as inspired, meaning the headings of letters. And some of them just kind of uh, were circulated like a general epistle, okay? Peter is the same way in his writings. So that's a little background I give you. Now, Paul begins chapter 1 with, he was an apostle chosen by the will of God. Now, right away, we're going to see Paul's in-depth teaching in all of his letters on the sovereignty of God. God chose me, Paul says. By the will of God, I'm an apostle. And if you go back to Paul's conversion, once again, I'll quote Acts or talk about Acts in chapter Acts chapter 9. His conversion was not along the lines of maybe more, they were all converted the same way through faith in Jesus Christ, okay? Message Paul himself preached in Acts. Repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul's was more along, if you will, the sovereign line, meaning if his conversion wasn't more or less, you're hearing the message, then you're kind of saying, I'm repenting, Lord, and I'm believing but Paul had none of that in mind during his famous conversion on the Damascus Road. If you go back to Acts chapter 9, he was on the way persecuting Christians, fighting against Jesus Christ, going after the followers of Jesus, and then he had this intervention. The Lord appeared to him. Paul, Paul, why persecutest thou me? And Paul asked, who are you? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you, Paul, to kick against the pricks. The famous conversion of Paul. What will you have me to do? And then he's sent and he's converted, Paul. Believes and is baptized. So he sees the sovereignty of God, meaning, man, God just intervened and stopped me in my tracks and made me a believer. And you see that theme in all of the letters of Paul. More so, maybe, it's all through the New Testament, particularly the Gospel of John, out of the four Gospels. John also has a lot of statements. Uh, no man can come to the Father. These are the words of Jesus himself. No man can come to the, uh, me unless my Father in heaven draw him. All that the Father give to me will come to me. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now, as you look at all those statements uh, from Jesus himself in the Gospel of John, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. All of those are saying and showing us that the only ones that can come to believe are the ones that God brings to believe. He cho chooses us. And yes, in the experience of conversion, we tell people about the gospel and we, and we make that invitation. We tell them, accept the Lord. And oftentimes we hear this language in evangelicalism, accept the Lord, which is okay, choose the Lord, which is okay, but in the, if you, as you're going back into the mind of God, we understand that He chose us, okay, and there's a lot of scriptures on that in the Bible, and some of the most famous ones are right in this chapter. So Paul begins by addressing the Ephesians, he says, I'm an apostle by the will of God then grace and peace unto you through Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. That's the message of grace. Now, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, who works all things according to the counsel of his own will, and whom we have redemption 
forgiveness of sins through his blood that we're accepted. He has made us accepted because of the death of Christ. He has made us accepted. That we should be holy without blame, righteous in his sight. So he begins by, by laying that down. God chose us, picked us before the worlds were made, okay? Before anything was, he had the church in mind. Now, he also gives us insight into the, the fuller purpose of what God's doing in redemption. That in the fullness of times, he would gather together all in one, all things in Christ, both in heaven and upon earth. Being I'm kind of teaching on my own, I might be able to do a little bit more in depth. But it's interesting, just before I left my house to come out here, I'd just look at my various verses, and one of them was a famous verse. I have them written all over, but it's Jacob's Ladder. And there were angels of God ascending and descending. And then I was quoting a verse the other day in one of the teachings uh, from 1 Thessalonians 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. So we will ever be with the Lord. So what we're seeing is in time, God is redeeming things. He's bringing everything back. If you go back to one of the videos I did with one of my street friends, uh, I forget what it's titled, but that friend, uh, that was little Charlie. And if you listen to the things that he was sharing, even though they have all these problems, he said, John, every molecule, everything is giving glory to God. And God is bringing all of it back. If you listen to it, it's kind of what Paul is saying in this uh, verse I just quoted. That God's purpose for the church, we're, we're just the beginning of it, the first verse. And this is the important role that people play in case I forget to mention it, at the last verse of this chapter, it, it's, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit more, but it says, all the great power that God did when he raised Jesus from the dead, the last verse says, and we are his body. Now I understand we, most of us as preachers and teachers, students of scripture, understand that we are called the body of Christ. Paul talks about that a lot in Corinthians. And, but also look at the power of that. Jesus was raised bodily, physically, from the dead. And he ascended physically, physically into the realm that we, we say he's seated at the right hand of the Father. So he's in a position of great authority, all authority. It's in this chapter as well. But in the earth, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ himself is in us we are his body so this there's this like great work of redemption continuing to be carried out through us and everything's in this process of all things in one that god's gonna everything is gonna be new heavens and new earth now paul prays for them he talks about the power that God has made available to us the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and the Spirit of God is now in us and it's through us that God's accomplishing all of these great mysteries all of these great things and then Paul has a prayer he says I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be opened that you would see what's actually happened that you would understand Paul had all this wisdom and revelation. There's a verse in this chapter, of Ephesians 1. It, it says, Who abounded unto us in all wisdom and prudence. That's the old King James. The little interpretation note said wisdom and understanding. No, I actually, there's a verse I quoted or wrote down a while ago, but it says, The Spirit of God gives us wisdom and discretion. So I, so I like to the word prudence in the old English version because the Spirit of God has given us wisdom and also prudence and discretion. So, meaning there's a lot of responsibility that comes with 
your eyes being open to seeing the greater picture. We have a lot of power as in the church as believers. The Spirit of God is in us. And the Word of the Lord, there are many examples I could give you, and I've given you some as we did the book of Acts. One was comes to mind was in the early church, I think it was Acts 5, but some Christians, it's a famous story because some Christians, a lot, a lot of them were selling their properties and bringing the money to the apostles and laying the money down at the apostles' feet and if distribution was made, they were helping one another out. And then the famous case of Ananias and Sapphira, Ananias and Sapphira, a husband and wife who had a certain uh, land and they sold it and they brought part of the money, which would have been okay, but they made it look like they brought all of the money. And Peter, the apostle, says, is this all the money? And, oh, yes, we brought it all like everybody else is doing. And he says, look, well, you, well, you had the property, it was yours, you could do whatever you did want with it, but why has Satan through your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And then the judgment from Peter, because he spoke that, the husband dies. Then the wife comes in, and he asks, he says, is this what you sold it for? Oh yes, so they're lying in that moment. Now the power that Peter had, as a believer and as an apostle, he said, the people that carried your husband out are at the door. He's dead. She didn't know. They're going to carry you out. She dropped down dead. Now, if Peter never did that, if Peter simply made the decision to say, God's grace is going to forgive you right now. And that could have also been a great witness. But he had the keys. We also have the keys. Meaning, we have authority. And so the fact that he spoke under the anointing and the power of God, it did in fact change things. And there are nations and kingdoms and governments in the earth, and they execute power and authority through decrees, through judicial systems, so forth. The church has greater power than all of that. Because even in this chapter it says, in the resurrection of Jesus, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, it says, all principalities and powers and kingdoms. Every name that can be named is under that. It's under that authority of Jesus. So that's what he is praying. I, like I give you the interpretation. Wisdom and prudence. Because Paul's prayer is that they would see what, the, what has happened in this thing. This redemption. And that they would see this broad scope of it. And if you see it, you begin to enter into it, you also begin to see you have the keys of the kingdom as well. Whatever you bond on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven. So he's saying there's great responsibility with it. And uh, Peter, in that little uh, example I just gave you, I, I wonder sometimes as I read through, read the writings in the New Testament, first like Peter as well, if he may be dealt with his own, when he made those harsh judgment calls, like the one I just gave you, I always wondered if it reminded him of his own denials of the Lord, that he knew through personal experience what it's like to be in the presence of God, to see and be with Jesus, and then under a time of test, which was the Peter's three, deni uh, three denials that you give into that. Like, why are you lie? Why did you lie, Peter? I'm sure he that went through his head a million times. And maybe he saw himself that day when he was so. Why did Satan fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Because he knew it from experience. And maybe that played a role in the harshness. But Paul himself is telling this this church at Ephesus to all of us may God open your eyes to this thing to what's happened he has redeemed us he has saved us he chose us and there's going to be wisdom 
and we're going to have discretion with that and prudence. All right, now this is chapter one. We're going to, I quoted the few uh, prominent verses on predestination. I'll just give a note. If I could do a lot of church history here, I could cover a lot, and I actually have some other things on church history that I can do. I don't want to do it all right now. Thanksgiving is coming up in a few days. And, and what do we, where, how do we remember the founding of this country? A lot of times we talk about the Mayflower, the Mayflower Compact, Plymouth Rock in New England. We kind of see that as what we as a heritage, and that's where Thanksgiving is, comes from. But do you know, the founding of the colony, the first one, was not, that was in 1620, okay, the Mayflower, and the pilgrims that came. But the English tried and did indeed settle a colony before that. In 1607, we call it Jamestown, okay, in 1607, uh, in Virginia, you had the settlement referred to as Jamestown. And the English, uh, initially, the English crown put about a thousand settlers there. And these were people that were uh, mostly men, but men that they knew, look, this is going to be a rough job, but we're going to try and settle. And that was Jamestown. And over a period of years, uh, there was about 8,000 men and women but they came over and trying to settle that Jamestown. And a lot of them died. But we don't look to that normally because the Thanksgiving feast and all, we're remembering this during the 1620 colony. But the, they were totally different. They were, uh, I think it's William Bradford, who later then becomes the governor. But there was about a, hundred, a little over 100 people, maybe like 102 or something. These were pilgrims or Puritans, separatists. These were Christians that were living in England in the 15, 1600s. And during the times of the Reformation that I talk about a lot, and the role that England had in breaking away from the Catholic Church, but the English, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, is kind of considered maybe what we say high church. So what happened during the time of the Reformation, which have covered a lot of that history, you had England also break away from Rome and from the Pope, primarily because Henry VIII tried to get that annulment from his wife. There was other political reasonings behind it, but at that time, uh, King Henry VIII said, I want this annulment, couldn't get it. We don't want the Pope to be the head of the church in England anymore. And that was sort of what the English, if you will, Reformation was. was. But they stuck to a lot of... Uh, Henry VIII himself wrote a book defending the sacraments, the seven sacraments. So he was considered at one point a defender of the church, and they even gave Henry VIII the title. Uh, the Catholic Church and the Pope gave him a title like he was a good defender because he was making that defense against the magisterial reformers, okay? Against Luther and the others and the Protestant movement. All right, so the church in England, I'm doing some history here, the church in England decided to stay sort of, and, and you had, of course, Mary, we refer to her as Bloody Mary, strong Catholic. You had Elizabeth, heirs to the crown, and James. And so you had a back and forth. Some were more Catholic, primarily uh, Queen Mary, than Elizabeth, uh, more towards the Protestant side. But the, sh the stronger Protestants, getting back to the pilgrims and the Mayflower, they did not like the compromise that they felt the Church of England still had within it, because it was still sort of somewhat of a Catholic church. To the strong Protestants that were living in England, 
like the ones that you'd find in, also in Germany and Switzerland, the strong reformers and the strong Protestants said, no, we want to separate from all that. They had their views and they said, we don't like the whole concept of a hierarchy and the bishops and all that. And so some of them eventually went to Holland. I think, I think it's an area called Leiden. So these people said, we want to worship in freedom. And they were from Puritan heritage, saying, we still want more reform in the church. Eventually, they decided to come to the new world. And they boarded a ship called the Mayflower. And there were women and children and men. But we often forget that journey was treacherous and people did indeed die. But then they planted, if you will, the colony in New England and this famous Plymouth Rock. And for them to have succeeded, and William Bradford becomes the governor, they were doing all this. There's even writings that we have from William Bradford quoting the, the letter to the Hebrews, talking about, uh, we look for a city that has foundations. Hebrews 11, whose builder, or 12, 11 or 12, whose builder and maker is God. They look for a city. And so these are referred to as the pilgrims of the Puritans. And then they landed. And then they did indeed establish a commonwealth, a colony. They succeeded. And if you think of it, the odds of them succeeding like that, because like I said, in 1607, the English were already trying to establish Jamestown, which they did, but... Uh, this group on the Mayflower, for them to have actually succeeded and for us to look back really to that time, more so than we do to the Jamestown settlers, very interesting, okay? So I'll throw some of that out in because it's not Thanksgiving in a few days. But Paul himself is saying to these early believers, God picked us and God chose us. He predestined us. In every Christian church I could I can get into all of the, what the reformers were speaking, and Luther and Calvin and Swingley, what they di disagreed on and all. But this was a big doctrine, the doctrine of predestination. And many Christians, some say, we do not believe in predestination. The word itself is in Scripture. I just quoted one today, and we, also in Romans we read it. Everybody believes in some doctrine of predestination, okay? Because it's in Scripture. Every Christian does. There are different ways people interpret it. But the most important thing I'll just throw in this initial one, it's sometimes it's hard for us to, as students of Scripture, say it's hard for us to believe a certain thing that God shows us because it doesn't seem to fit in all the later outcomes, all the other things, certain things don't seem fair. But remember, we are, if you get the broader scope, that ultimately the purpose of God is to, for everything, all creation, Paul teaches in Romans as well, all, Romans 8, all creation is in this process of redemption. So if you get the broader scope, then maybe we don't fight so much of the technical details of various things that we don't fully understand. So that's what we see in Ephesians 1. So uh, let me end. I did some history on this one. We'll, we'll go through. I gave you a little background. I'll have to do a little writing because I didn't write on uh, Ephesians. I don't have a commentary presently. I have some little notes I wrote in the past. So... Uh, follow along in this study. I'm still going to finish our Kings, still doing Kings, and we've already concluded the book of Acts. Okay, Father, I, I pray a blessing on everybody that watches this video, whenever they see it, years and years from now, or maybe a, a few weeks after I make these, and I pray that you would instill in everybody that they would see also the bigger picture, that they themselves would just read this chapter these verses that I quoted, and that they would just read these verses and believe them, and, and believe them, and that you would uh, work in each and every person. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.